So I want to introduce Aaron uh, Berry, a CPA, just a wonderful, wonderful person. Excited to see what, what she's going to share with us because, like you said, things are changing all the time. And then I know, like as a self-employed person, how do I best take care of me? You know, and so not only where I'm at now and whatever the government needs, but anyway, we're excited to have you. bio about me. So I spent four years in the Marine Corps. I was a military police thank officer. You, thank you. Wow. I initially went in um, because I wanted to uh, work for the FBI and catch serial killers and, <laughs> and mass murderers. And they actually, the FBI prefers a Marine with a degree over anybody. Um, so, but I go in, I get married, I have my son, and my mom tells me it's no longer, I can't do that, it's not a safe job. And I said, oh, mom, it's not like I want to bust down the door and say, freeze FBI. I, like, totally did. <laughs> but I'm, like, fine. And I took accounting in high school, and when I was young, I remember telling my mom I was going to work at Ernst & Young. I didn't know what it was, but I was like, I'm working there. And uh, at nine, I was helping my mom's friend, who was a nurse, balance her checkbook because she did, just got divorced from her husband as a CPA. Oh. And if I, ever, I have a standing offer. He actually works for a, a regional firm that's in Tucson and up here in Phoenix. And so if I ever wanted to work for them, I could. But, um, I work for them in Bellevue, Washington. Oh, OK. She, she thought that uh, you know, like at the end of the month, if she had money left over, you know, she could spend it. She's not remembering like, you know, things that come annually or quarterly or, or whatever and stuff. And my mom would tell me, like, I could tell the change back to the cashier before the cashier could tell me change. So um, I actually started going to school at the University of Arizona from Tucson and joined the Marine Corps and came back and ended up going to ASU. So there's, I'm one of three people my parents talked to um, that are considered what we call scum devils down there in uh -huh. Tucson. Yeah. And, um, but it was either we come here and I go to school at ASU and my husband goes to Universal Technical Institute, which is in the Kansas School yeah. here, or I go back to Tucson with our son and my husband goes to Wyoming for nine months and we spend another year apart because we had spent one year when he went to Japan. Uh, we didn't want to do that, so here we stayed. So we've been married almost 20 years. Um, I call my kid, my son Nate, he's my kiddo, he's like 6'1", and um, I can't call, you know, when he got older, like all the names I used to call when he was little, I, I couldn't call him anymore, so he's oh, just called well, How kiddo. tall is dad? My dad, my husband's actually 5'9". Um, I'm 5'10", my dad, before he settled, was 6'2", um, so the height comes from our side. Okay. So, uh, not that my husband's short, because I think like 5'7", five, 5'8", five, is like average for a guy, but, and then he slouches and I stand up straight, so <laughs> it's a really big difference. So, um, I got my CPA license in 2008, so it's been almost 11 years now. Oh, and this, sorry, I, I, I'm in a networking group, and um, that was just a joke. So. That's my sister. Um, she and I do a lot of, uh, we do these hot chocolate races and some scavenger races together. Oh, wow. And that's my son. Um, what a cutie. I just, I just dropped, we just, he's in Orlando for the next however many months. He's doing a Disney internship and he's apparently going to be a friend of Goofy in Epcot, which means he's Goofy, but they don't yeah. actually, they're not, mm -hmm. allowed, they're not actually Goofy, there's only one Goofy. So, mm -hmm. super excited. He's living with like, we're all like three Australians and a New Zealand guy. And Epcot is so amazing. Yeah. So he's so we're excited, and he's found out that if he goes back and gets hired on as like an actual like because they they're getting paid while they're there. But if he goes and gets hired on as a full time employee or a part time employee, they will actually pay for him to go to school. So he could go back and get another degree because um, he wanted to go back to Florida. He wanted an advertising degree, and they don't actually offer advertising in Arizona. They offer marketing, and apparently it's not the same thing. He tells me. So that's my husband here. Um, a couple months ago, we, we uh, these are all Marine Corps friends of ours, uh, and it's interesting because Marines are different than like the other branches of the service, because mm -hmm. once a Marine, always a Marine, mm -hmm. and we don't call them ex or former, and every former Marine will correct you if you call them an ex-Marine. And so we hadn't seen these guys in 19 years, but it was oh like we had God. never not seen them. Yeah. And he's actually a DPS officer here, so if you're ever coming off the 202 during rush hour um, and you don't have another driver and you're in the carpool bay and you'll get pulled over by him. Oh, it's about oh, time. Good. So that's where he hangs out, and um, he actually was uh, retired from, um, 
I think DPS or somewhere up, and he owns a brewery in Kingman, and he just switched jobs. He was uh, the deputy assistant director of the VA police. So um, it's a lot of us, we were in Yuma, and so a lot of us are still kind of around, and we get together, and November 10th is our Marine Corps birthday, and yeah. so we get together and, and hang out and stuff still, so it's nice. Kept them, and the one guy actually with the beard, I just saw him at the rock and roll on Sunday. Oh. So, and then oh, these are two of my dogs. This is Pebbles, and that's Bugsy. I call him Bugs Bunny. He's a little jerk. He likes to steal my socks and my gloves, and apparently yesterday my running watch. Oh. And then this is Minnie Mouse, and um, we had a Bam Bam, which is why we had a Pebbles, but he was our older dog, and we had Pebbles with that a couple years ago. So here, um, some of the big changes we have, like I said, this is only for right now, 2018 to 2025, and then it's supposed to go back to how it was, except for the corporate laws. We'll see. So one of the biggest upsets, depending on your tax bracket, is the exemptions are gone. So the $4,051 you get for each person, you, your spouse, and all your kids. And I have some Mormon clients that you know have like six of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's gone. So the standard deduction is eight is twelve thousand for single, eighteen for head of household, twenty-four thousand for married filing jointly. Um, that's almost double. Last year the married filing jointly was at twelve thousand six hundred, something like that. So it's almost doubled. Um, but I tell clients, I go, just because you might not itemize on the federal, doesn't mean you're not going to still want to itemize on the state, so you're still going to have to gather all that same okay. information just in case. Mm -hmm. One of the how, other biggest... Oh. How does the single uh, figure figure in if you're the only one in your head of household? So head of household, because I actually had married clients that got husbands say, I want to be head of household this year, and I'm like, that's not how it works, you're 50-50. Head of household is if you are uh, have dependents, so you have children. So if it's just you by yourself, you're single, and if you have you and you've got children or, you know, like a, you're taking care of a parent or something, if they're living with you, you can be head of household. Um, this was the biggest upset, and what's interesting is, is we've got um, the Democrats who want people to pay more taxes, and then this tax law came out, and who does it affect the most? California, um, New York, New Jersey, and Rhode okay. Island. Oh. Because their property taxes and their income taxes, California's income tax rate is 9.3%. Our max tax rate is 4.54%, and in marriage you hit that at $450,000. It's expensive over there. So they came out and said, okay, between state and local income taxes, property taxes, registration on your vehicle, sales tax on new vehicles, that all that, you're capped out at $10,000. I have clients who have that and we're holding. Yeah. So California, and they all got together and I'm like, okay, we're going to figure our way around this. And they're like, well, we're going to do it as a payroll tax deduction. And they're like, well, you can't. We're going to do this. And they finally came out and the states came out with a tax credit that you can pay them. Okay. Well, the IRS says, well, that's nice. But for whatever you get a benefit for, you can't take as a deduction on your federal return. So basically they screwed the 33 other states that already had a tax credit. Because again, we have tax credits here that give us a dollar for dollar deduction and we were itemizing it on the federal return. And the IRS has come out and said that is a no-go anymore. So like, let's say for instance, like if you, went to, if you buy a, um, a membership to the art museum, mm -hmm. they can say, okay, membership's $80 and 40 of this is tax deductible and the other 40 is considered like your membership, right? So the IRS in that case would say, okay, you could write off the forty dollars. The other forty you can't. So we were writing off, you know, for a married couple, you could write off about forty five hundred dollars in tax credits. So you're not paying anything to the state, and then you're getting to write off, and you know, in the twenty five percent tax bracket, that's over a thousand dollars you're saving in taxes. Mm -hmm. So they came out and said that because the states came out and their and the reasoning was tax avoidance. They said you can't take that anymore. So we're super happy with those states right now. Oh. And then there's for this one applied to to the agents that get 1099s. But if you're a W-2 and you work from home or you mileage those kinds of things, you're not allowed to write those off anymore. There's a few um, 2106 expenses left for military and a couple other people. But like I have salespeople that work for Lazy Boy 
and we would write off their mileage because they have to drive to people's houses. Mm -hmm. I would write off their nails because in their employment contract they were required to keep their nails manicured. All these things I can't write off any of that stuff anymore. It's all gone. But on the 1099 you can. 1099 you're still good. So, and I had all these people going, oh, I'm just going to become a, you know, but now they want to become a 1099, which before they, you know, you, know, you, you didn't want to. And then the child tax credit doubled. So it went from $1,000 to $2,000. And then um, when, you know, the way the tax law is written is once your child turns 17, you really don't have to spend much money on them anymore. And you don't get a credit anymore. Well, now they have the other dependents would be anybody that's 17 or over that qualifies, you get $500. And the other bonus is for this was the for a married couple at like $125,000 you phase out of getting this child tax credit. Now it's 450. So more people are getting in and it's doubled. So that's good. So um, I did pick up some good stuff in my class, um, and one of the things is. Um, because of this whole, you know, I've got clients who are right on that cusp of maybe they're going to itemize and maybe they're not. Mm -hmm. And what can you do? Well, one of their things they recommended was this donor advised fund. So you could front load, let's say, $30,000 into a donor advised fund at like Vanguard or some. There's a couple of different brokerage houses that do these things. Put $30,000 in there, and then over the next five years, you could send $6,000 out to charities. But you get the write off the year you put it in the account. So it's kind of like stacking. Mm -hmm. So, because again, like I, you know, so it might be that one year we itemize, one year we don't, one year we itemize, and, and a lot more clients now are asking, well, should I pay off my house? You know, and their financial advisors are like, no, I can make you more money than your interest rate. I'm going, yeah, if something happens, your house is paid off, and you can always take out a loan if you need to. But it's, you know, just, so, and then um, one of the other benefits sometimes, you know, you have your, pay your vehicle registration you know, two years or whatever. I mean, you do still save $8.50 if you pay it every two years or whatever. Um, so the question is, is, is this tax law going to affect you? So uh, a sole proprietor filing a Schedule C, that's a basic 1099, that's a PLC and LLC, and has done nothing else with the IRS, you're a Schedule C. Yes, it's going to affect you. It's going to affect the S Corp. It's going to affect partnership returns. So, and and for the most part, it's going to be better. And I've had people go, oh, I was told I had to be an S-Corp, I can't write off my expenses. They got that from a Mary Kay-like blog or like a Mary Kay-like, I don't know. Like yes. Zillow. And I'm, I, I was like, where are you getting this information from? You know, and, I, and every year I always get something. I heard once you had 75, you don't file taxes anymore. You know, so, no, that's not true. <laughs> um, it's possible, but that's not, there's not an age limit where you have to stop. There's actually somebody that's, running, going to run for office next year, where he wants to give everybody at, at between the ages of 18 and 64 a monthly dividend of $1,000. It's called something dividend, I don't remember exactly what he called it, because it says, you know, most Americans, if they have like a $1,000 emergency come up, they're not going to be able to pay for it. Of course, they're going to spend it. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to save it. We all know that, right? So, um, so anyway, so there's all kinds of, of wacky new stuff that we're hearing. Um, so, Aaron, back to the VLT. Uh -huh. Yes. If you're taking the standard, is there a place to claim the VLT also? No, because the standard deduction, the IRS says you can take the itemized deduction or the standard, whichever is greater. So, so it's one VLT the goes on itemized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, and just because you might not hit the $24,000 number with the IRS doesn't mean you're not going to hit Arizona standard deduction because theirs is a calculation based on income. And so it's not. So it's different, and they don't have that because we don't ever conform to anything. Um, they don't have the ten thousand dollar cap on the taxes, and they don't have the medical restrictions and everything that the IRS has. Because the IRS, they went back to the seven and a half percent adjusted gross income for the medical expenses. It had gone up to ten for a couple of years. They bumped it back down, probably because it didn't really matter, because <coughs> most people aren't getting it anyway. Um, and is that strictly the 1040? Is what? If you're, if you're filing the 1065, is it expense there? Is what expense? The BLG. Um, You can. Depends, because you're either going to take actual or mileage. You know, you could take one. Right. Of, that's another one where it's one or the other. But that doesn't have anything to do with standard deduction on the 1040. Though. No. Right. But you'd have to, you know, but again, like, 
the way the registration and those kinds of things would work would be you'd have to look at what percentage of your usage of your vehicle is business. So if your business is 75%, you know, if you use your business, your car 75% of business, you could write off 75% of your gas, your insurance, your registration, um, the interest on your vehicle if you're paying interest, or you can take the mileage. The mileage rate's 58 cents a mile this year because it's supposed to cover repairs and maintenance and all that kinds of stuff. If you have more than if you have more than five vehicles, they require you to take actual expenses. They no longer allow you to take mileage. Um, so this is so this pass through deduction that they have. It was called the Section 199A, um, and it's there's a qualified business income deduction, and so basically the short form is, is you get to take 20 percent off the top, so you, or after your net profit. So if you 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 take your gross 1099, you write off all your ordinary necessary expenses. Entertainment expenses are now gone, so you can no longer take your clients to golfing or to a Cardinals game. They don't allow that anymore. Or lunch. That's still out. The meals, they stayed. It was going away. They decided to go ahead and let that stay, but the entertainment was definitely off. And I know there's going to be somewhere else it's going to get put. Mm -hmm. Because um, a couple years ago, I was sitting at the golf tournament, the, whatever the yeah. golf tournament is yes. here. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I'm sitting in one of those box seats with a, with a real estate law firm. And those boxes are $125,000 a year uh, for the week to rent a box. A Is that all? Good heavens. <laughs> They're going to want to write that off still. So what do you call it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, I tell, and I tell clients, and I'll tell you, this is good advice for you guys. So, like this is not meals and entertainment. Okay? This is business promotions or advertising, something like that, right? Because meals and entertainment, you only get, the meals part, you only get half. Okay, so if you decide to go to, I don't know, Subway and get a bunch of subs and you go to uh, loan officers because you're trying to, you know, get some more contacts, you're taking them food, like yeah. legal bribery, right? Yeah. And you drop it off, you're trying to promote your business. Mm -hmm. That's why I tell clients, I put that stuff in business promotions for advertising, that kind of thing, because I'm, I'm not getting, you know, the meals entertainment is like we go out to, to eat. And I can write out, if I pay, I can write off your meal, not mine. That's where the 50% comes in. And I tell them, okay, and if I were to take all of you out, I'm not going to put that in meals and entertainment. I'm going to put that again, business promotions, because I'm paying for everybody. My portion is really small. And make sure on your receipts, you know, you write down who you had lunch with and that kind of thing. And then, you know, your tax preparer is not going to need to see it. Necessarily, but you're going to want to keep it in case the IRS wants to ever take a so look at it. In lieu of taking off some of these other things, there's an automatic, potentially an automatic 20%. No, it's in addition to. It's addition to. So, Sam's not getting to take the entertainment anymore. The IRS says you take your gross no. income, take off all your ordinary and necessary expenses, and then you can take 20% more off that. Okay, so that's actually good. It's good. Yeah. So, the W 2 employee got the short end of this stick in this deal. And the small business owners are getting it as long as they fall under this income. Like I said, this, the short answer is 20% off that net profit. Net profit is $100,000. You're paying income tax on 80. And it's a, it can get a little more complicated um, for a couple reasons. So um, you also have to have W-2 wages. If your income, if your income is over, if it's under 315 and you're married, and it's under 157,500 and you're single, you're net. And, that and that's your taxable income. So that means all of your income plus your, K plus your Schedule C or your K-1 income, less your pension contributions, less your standard deduction or your itemized deductions, that number, okay? So if it's under this, you get the 20% and there's no big deal. If it's over any of these numbers, then there's rules that have to go with that. So, um, <laughs> and you're like, okay, well, you know, I mean, if being over, you know, it's like if you have problems with that, if you're making over $350,000, it's, you know, mm -hmm. it's like a bad.
bad problem to have, right? Mm -hmm. um, do the PLLCs file a return and do they create a K-1? It, it depends. A single member PLLC, if it does nothing else, because remember the LLC is actually a state entity, the, it's nothing to the IRS. The IRS says if you're a single member LLC or PLLC and you do nothing, you're a Schedule C on your personal return. If you're a two member PLLC and you do nothing, you're a partnership. Your other options are to become an S Corp. And you can be, and then it's nice because you don't even have to, because because you can make yourself an ink, and then you have to file paperwork with the IRA, or with the corporation commission every year, and it's fifty dollars in a dumb form, and it's annoying, and they fine you if you don't fill it out. Or you can just make yourself an LLC and tell the IRS I want to be an S corp. Because even if you're an ink, you still have to tell the IRS you, that you're. They'll say you're a C corp unless you tell them you want to be an S. So the C corp pays a flat tax. You know, pays a tax at their tax rate um, on their net profit, and then we talked about the double taxation. If you take cash out, you know, if you've got hundred thousand dollars profit in your C corp, you pay income tax on there. You pull that hundred thousand dollars; that's now a dividend to you on your personal return, and you pay tax on it again. So on, a, on an S corp, you pay tax on your net profit, and you're allowed to pull the dividends out of the business, so and not get double taxed on it. You just pay tax on it once. So, um, a lot of people are moving to the S Corp um, because if you make $100,000, that's my, I can do the math, if you do $100,000, you're paying $15,300 over to the government for Social Security and Medicare taxes, plus your income taxes. If you're an S Corp, the IRS says you have to take a reasonable salary. I like the 60-40 split. Another, uh, and I also look at, I ask my clients, um, when they say reasonable, they go, okay, well, clearly, whatever, you know, if you had an hourly rate, um, if I were out of work for a month, what would it cost to replace me? Well, what I'm going to pay somebody is not the same as my hourly rate. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I would take as a W-2. And then I can take the rest as a dividend. So what was happening at first was people were making $200,000, taking a $5,000 salary, and the IRS was like, and they can come in, and if you don't take a reasonable salary, they will tell you what they think a reasonable salary is, and it will not be in your favor. So I have had some clients, too, where I've slowly kind of, as their income's gone up, I'm like, okay, let's, you know, pay a little bit. Like, why would I want to pay more on taxes? I'm like, because you don't want the IRS to come in and say you need to do more. Is it a standard percentage that you can rely on? Or? No, I, like I said, I just, you know, I personally, if, if it's 60-40, where 60 is wages and 40 is profit, I feel like that's good. Um, again, or I go back to, you know, what, what would it cost, you know, um, like I have a guy who cleans carpets, and he takes, he was taking last year $400 a week, and then when we looked at the end of the year, I'm like, okay, well, I think we need to bump this up, so he's taking $600 a week. That's $15 an hour, 40 hour a week. That's probably what he would pay somebody else to clean the carpets. So, um, so I think that they'll be fine. But again, if I have, and I've had clients where um, I took on a new client this year, and I'm starting with 19 going forward, because the old accountant that's in Chicago, this guy's making a hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars, and he's not taking a W two. He's gonna get in trouble, and then the preparer's gonna get in trouble. Mm -hmm. So he's starting clean in 2019, and I'm getting him on a salary. And so we don't want to have this, you know, we don't want the IRS to come, you know. And, I, and one of my old bosses always said um, that uh, pigs get fed, hogs get slaughtered. <laughs> and I always tell people that. So it's good. I like that, right? So you want to be aggressive, but not overly aggressive. Because you don't want to get, you don't want to do anything that's going to get the IRS to go, hmm. And we were talking about a realtor client who, um, was over the $157,500 number she was going to be. She wasn't supposed to be a couple months ago. She had some big closings happen. All of a sudden, she's bumped under this number. She's going to lose out on this 20% deduction unless we can figure something out. So she's buying a horse trailer we're going to write off. Because I was telling them, she specializes in horse properties, million dollar horse properties. And she goes to horse shows, and she sets up a booth and she tries to network and get clients while she's at these horse shows. So now she's got this trailer for her horse 
but she's got an office. Part of it's an office, and it's going to be air conditioned or heated, and it's going to have a table and a computer. And I go, I think the IRS will buy that. So she bought an eighty thousand dollar trailer at the end of the year for cash, and she's now going to get the twenty percent deduction. And literally, I think that that trailer, she's out of pocket ten thousand dollars in taxes. Ten thousand dollars total. Yeah. Because of what she would have lost in the deduction yeah. by not Susan buying this trailer. Yeah. Like so well, um, if you're already drawn on Social Security mm -hmm. and you're an old old person, you still have to pay into Social Security? Absolutely. Why? That is a good question. It's a rule because you also have to pay income taxes on it if your income is too high, which seems silly because it's income tax on on a tax, which always baffled me, but I didn't are you telling me there's no benefit in getting old? <laughs> if you know, if, you know <laughs> so I mean, I have clients that stopped having to file because all they have is Social Security, which you know is not necessarily that much money. You know, it's twenty, twenty-five thousand, thirty thousand dollars that they're living off of every year, or whatever, or they've got money in savings or whatever. But yeah, you're right. So you're gonna put money in, and and your your Social Security will increase, and it's possible depending on how old you are. If you are not at full retirement age yet and you make too much money, you have to start paying it back too. You gotta watch that number. On um, your 60 40 uh, mm -hmm. figure, you would pay Social Security on the 40 that you draw? 60 on the draw. Oh. As an S Corp, yeah. I wanna be slightly over half. So, and then also it depends too, because um, if you have employees working for you, you're making money off of what they do. You don't wanna pay Social Security and income tax on what they do is what you do, mm -hmm. you know. So I have I have an air conditioning guy, and I think we pay him seventy-two thousand dollars a year. He still nets about another hundred fifty, two hundred thousand dollars after he pays his guys. But he's got three guys working for him, and they go out and do jobs, and they make him money and stuff. And you know, so he's taking a good salary. And again, I mean, that's mm -hmm. what thirty dollars, thirty-two dollars an hour. Um, more than that, thirty-five dollars an hour. Yeah. Be about seventy-two thousand dollars. That's a good break for an air conditioning guy. Um, so, uh, so if you're above that hundred, that hundred fifty-seven thousand five hundred as a single person, or three fifteen in t total income, so that would include your spouse too, not just the business. Um, then you have to start worrying about um, the phase outs and the next part of the of the math, which is having to do with your W-2s, which is why I had that realtor buy that trailer. Because as a Schedule C, you can't pay yourself a W-2, it's not allowed. And as a partnership, you can't pay yourself a W-2, it's not allowed. So if you're going to be subject to a cap based on what your you know, percentage, either 20% or what your wages are, but you're not allowed to take wages, yeah. they didn't think it all the way through. Mm -hmm. So. We, you know, that's where we have to get a little creative with trying to figure out how to keep your income down. Cost benefit. Right. Um, you know, and, and then, and I know that health insurance penalty is still around for one more year. And last year I had a client who we ended up having to have him max out an IRA and max out his SEP. Or else he was going to have to pay $11,000 back of the tax uh, uh, penalty for having, he got the, he was, had the insurance on the exchange, but he got a credit from the year, because his income was much lower the year before. Yeah. And they were going to make him pay all this money back. And so I'm like, okay, well, I can't just, I'm not just going to write off fake expenses, because I'm not going to lose my license for your $11,000 taxes. But, well, let's see what we can do. And so I'm playing around with the legal things. Well, let's see if we can put some money away into retirement or whatever. And sure enough, we got him out of the penalty. So he was out of pocket a little more money than the taxes. It was his money. But it's his money. He gets to keep it. And that's the other thing I tell clients. I go, you always want to, yeah, you want to do, if you want write-offs, you want where you're going to still keep the money, right? Because I have clients be like, well, should I, you know, I'm going to owe a lot of taxes. Should I just buy something? I'm like, do you need it? Because if you spend $10,000 on a piece of equipment to save $3,000 in taxes, you're still out $7,000. You didn't need it. If you need it, buy it. But if you don't need it, don't just buy it. Just you know, pay the tax, or again, put away into retirement things where you're actually going to keep, lowers your tax bill, but you still get to keep the money. Yeah. So, um, so, like I said, if, if you're over that, 
315, you look at what your, your W-2s are. So if you have a $10,000 W-2 and a $300,000 net profit from the business, 20%, $60,000, 25% of your W-2 is $2,500. Guess which deduction you get? $2,500. That's it. So which is why, again, I think, like I said, they missed the mark on the on the two of the three companies where you don't actually take a W-2. I had an IRS agent tell me, ask me why this partnership didn't take a W-2. Are you kidding? Like, it's in your rules. Like, you can't take W-2. It says it. But they also say you can't take anything with the IRS advisors. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> but I was like... And she's an auditor. I'm an auditor. So. Erin, do you do business taxes as well? I do. Personal? I do business, personal. I do trusts. I do nonprofits. I have a couple of nonprofits that I do. So um, how does the bookkeeping interrelate with what you do? Um. So as far as like, it depends. Like, like, do I do bookkeeping too? Yeah. Yes, I do have. Some, I do have some clients I do bookkeeping for. So if for. we have a separate bookkeeper, you mm -hmm. enter. With that? I do absolutely. I have a couple that I work really well with, and, and stuff. And they provide a P and L for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a P and L. Depending on what you file, if you're filing an S corp or partnership return, I'm going to ask for um, bank statements, uh, bank reconciliations, because you're required to put a balance sheet on the tax return to show you know what your everything is and stuff. And I had years ago, I had this lady, and she says, I am QuickBooks certified. Why do you need the backup? And I said, I go, well, there's two things. I said, you're either incompetent or you're stealing. So pick one or give me what I asked for. Mm -hmm. I said, because all I'm doing is trying to match the numbers. So if mm -hmm. the bank statement says you have $5,000 and the bank said, rec says you have $5,000 and your book says you have $5,000, we're good. Like, I'm just, I got to match, I just got to match the information. Mm -hmm. So that's an important part of what we do. It is. And, and it's interesting because. You know, I tell clients, and I like business returns a lot because there's, you've got to balance, right? There's a balance sheet, has to balance. With, a, with an individual return, a Schedule C, I said, you give, you know, 10 CPAs the same information, you're going to get 11 different answers on what their tax liability is going to be, right? You know, because some people may be, some people might write something off, some people might not. Mm -hmm. You know, I have clients that are like, I told, if I told, if I put a magnet on my car, I can write my car off 100% because it is business use all the time. I advertise, I'm like... I'm not going to do it because it's really not. You know, I mean, you can try and I just, I mean, now you have to be right off. How can you just buy right off a $50,000 car that you use 10% of the time just because you put a magnet on there? I don't think the IRS is going to buy it. And I'm going to get a prepare penalty if the IRS comes back and they and they make a change. And the taxpayer gets a 25% penalty if the IRS makes a change of more than like 25% of tax. So, like, if you owe five hundred dollars and they go back and now all of a sudden you owe ten thousand, you're gonna get hit with a big fine too. So you don't want to do that. How is it determined the percentage of personal use? Based on the mileage that you're supposed to keep. They have uh, tables for that. Uh, well, you're supposed to keep track of every time in your car where you're going for like business and whatnot. And they'll take guesstimates. And if clients don't actually have mileage, the IRS will actually let you use like your um, oil changes. Because usually they write on there what your mileage was, and so you just give them your oil changes receipts for the year, and then they look. Because I had somebody that says, "Oh, they gave me their spreadsheet and had mileage." I'm like, "There is no way you drove it was like 400,000 miles or whatever, some a huge number." And she's a realtor. She's like, "But I drive all over like the valley, and I'm in Santan Valley, and blah." And I'm like, "Mathematically impossible." Yeah. I go, "Let me show." She's like, "Oh no no, like I did it on a spreadsheet." I'm like, "Go back and just check your math." Thousand miles a day. Over. She had there was there must have been she ended up at forty some thousand, which I bought. There was a math error. That's what I told her. I'm like, there's a math error in your sales spreadsheet somewhere. I go because it's not you know possible. And then I'll have other clients I'm like, yeah, I drove eighty thousand miles. I'm like, okay, so let's say you know let's divide that by 52, 50 weeks out of the year, six days a week. Do you think you drove X amount of miles during the day? Oh no. I'm like, okay, let's start this over. How many miles do you think you drive a day? And then let's go the other way. Yeah. You know, and then I'll look at the client's income, um, too, for realtors, you know, and then I'll ask you, like, what's your, what your, what your market is, right? Mm -hmm. Because, obviously, if you make $100,000 and your market is the hundred dollars to $200,000 home range, you get 3% of that, right? You're going to sell more homes 
than my, my clients are selling million dollar homes that are only selling two, three homes you know, a year. Of course, I've learned that neither one of those is actually the desirable range. Like you, like I found that it's the three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars second time home buyer because they know what they want. They don't need their hand held. They just want you to give them the house and they want to move on, right? Usually the lower ones are first time home buyers. They have lots of questions. They don't know what's going on. And the million dollar people are just, you know, they are picky. And they are a lot of, they're just, they're just high maintenance. And that's a lot of driving and, you know, you're probably going back to the same property a ton of times or whatever. And you said you do trust. Mm -hmm. Do you create trust? No. I have attorneys um, that I know that I send people to. Um, and so anybody I ever refer you to, I get nothing from. I always make sure I tell people I get no monetary benefits from anybody. Like, because I have um, financial advisors who say, but you're already sending us people. We have this program where we get a kickback. I'm like, I don't want a kickback. I like the fact I can tell my clients I'm sending them to you because I think you're going to do a good job. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have two attorneys that I refer to um, that are, well, one's, one's West Side and, and in Central and one's West Side. Um, one of them's off of 17th Street in Bell and stuff, and they're really good. Um, and they, um, and one does bankruptcy law as well. He liked that over family law because he said in bankruptcy, somebody at least wins. In family law, there's always a loser. Mm -hmm. And he didn't like he didn't like that. So, um, uh, Aaron, yeah. with logging your mileage mm -hmm. on your gas receipts, is that acceptable? Yeah. Or uh, do you have a smartphone? There's an app. There's is Mileage there, IQ. Is there one that you recommend? Mileage IQ is yeah. good. I think it's like two bucks a month or two ninety nine a month, which is a write off. Um, and then I, and you just when you get in the car, you open the app and you just tell it whether it's personal or business. Mm -hmm. Swipe and it left and it's personal. Swipe it right, it's business. That's Mileage IQ. Mileage IQ. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you can actually write the reason you're actually um, making that stop. Like, you know, it's an open house or you're showing homes. Gotcha. You can track it that way. It's yeah, and I see, and for me, I only keep an Excel spreadsheet because I don't drive a ton. Um, so it's, it's, and I've been doing it for years, and, and it's just, for me, that's just one tab says 15, one tab says 16, 17, 18, 19, and I put my beginning mile, you know, so like I said, but I only have, like, let's say I might only drive 100, 125. You know different things every year. You guys are probably doing you know five, six different places a day, or whatever. But I do play. All goes well. Yeah, bank. You know, post office. You know, meetings. Anything like that, right? I put at least twenty thousand miles a year. That's a lot of work. For us. Charlotte and I, we, we each put about thirty to thirty-five thousand of business miles each. Yeah. yeah, because of, and at the end, you know, we we have our mileage and then uh, our tax preparer will ask us some questions just to make sure like do you have another vehicle yeah. you know because they want to know and yeah, they miles around and, trip just and what from percentage from of your mileage yeah. is really for business versus pleasure because if if, if you're the what was that phrase you used a pig versus oh, a pigs hog. get fed and hogs get slaughtered yeah if you're going to be a hog about it you're probably going to set yourself up for a little bit of a on scrutiny. <laughs> well, <laughs> right, and then so 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 there's items that the IRS looks at, and, and that is is one of them. And realtors are on their chopping block. They've been for years. They think you're cheaters. Um, and you know, and I don't know if it's the mileage or what it is about you. They think you're cheating. Four hundred thousand miles is not unreasonable. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I told her I go. You would literally have to be driving to Los Angeles and back every day. She made like that. Ten times around the world. <laughs> so, like I said, she did eventually come back and go, yeah, she had a math error. And like well, I said, it's just interesting because yesterday I teach part-time. Mm -hmm. Just just going to the hospital and back was 110 miles. Yeah. And that was just in one day. You know, and then that doesn't, so anyway. That's why I like working from home now. Mm -hmm. And one day I said, I'm like, oh, I'm going to look for a commute to work. And go across the living room. <laughs> But I used to drive. But I used to drive from. Um, we live. I live off of 83rd and Bell. Yeah. And uh, or 87th and Bell. And I used to drive to Missouri and 12th Street. And oh. there's like two routes. I, I mean, it just and it was it was awful. Yeah. And I don't. I don't like that. And actually, what's funny is, is where I met Gary. He and I used to work at our office with 83rd and Bell. So it's funny that I didn't used to live in that area. We just moved mm -hmm. there last year. So I said it's funny because now I'm like less than two miles from that office. And stuff, and um, 
funny. Yeah, so, you know, like I said, and, and I tell clients, because, you, you know, you can write off a portion of your cell phone, you can write off a portion of your, your internet expense. Um, how do you know how much proportion? I, I do a educated guess, right? And for me, so we have, um, right now, we have uh, three cell phones on the plan, and I write off about 60 to 65% of it because we're paying a week pay for the gigs. We have unlimited data. Okay. Well, I can show the IRS, okay, before I went on my own, I had two gigs on my phone. That was it. And my husband didn't have a smartphone, and my son had two gigs. And then I went on my own and look at my usage because I will take my laptop to clients or I will work in the car on the way driving somewhere, and I need to be able to get on the Internet and stuff. Yeah. And, I, and I said, and so watch as I'm progressing. You know, and I said, so that, the fact that we went to unlimited data is for the business, for no other reason for the business. So I said, so I feel like I can write that. So do you, do you think that the IRS is, is keeping up with the technology need that we have where before we would have a landline, mm -hmm. and today I don't know very many people that do, really. And, you know, I have one now, because I'm tired, well, the, and the reason why is because I, well, I have a, no, I actually have a fax line, too. People, why do you have a fax? Well, because... Again, I do. I work with a bankruptcy attorney, and a lot of those people haven't filed a bunch of years, and they don't have their stuff. I have to call the when the IRS is actually working. I can call them. They can fax me. It's a fast way to get information. So I have I have the fax, but I have the landline. I set up as a business line. I have 400 and some clients that have my cell phone. Yeah. And so, so do you personally. think that? Do you think that <laughs> yeah. in, in a case like this where we don't have that anymore, uh, taking 60, 70 percent of each of our phones, plus we have another. Phone, cell phone mm -hmm. besides that is is that generally for full-time realtors sometimes it's even more I mean yeah. sometimes you I could say for real it's probably 90 percent yeah 80 90 percent yeah. you know and same thing for like the longer you're realtor the less it's personal <laughs> exactly <laughs> right <laughs> you know yeah. I mean I have you know how many how many like friends do I have in my phone 20 <laughs> How many clients have 400, right? Yeah. It's 95, you know. How many of your friends don't ask you a text question? Well, actually, a lot of them are clients now. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, um, all my running friends are now all my clients and stuff, too, and, and everything. And, um, and I actually just, I have a, I'm doing now an insurance agent out in Chandler. I'm going to start doing his bookkeeping while his, one of his 1099 contractors is like one of my best friends, her daughter. And so when he came in, I said, I just want to let you know that what happens in this office stays in this office. Nothing that happens here goes back to her. Nothing goes to, you know. Yeah. So she's not going to know how much money you make. And I go, and my, I said, I have, we have friends that taxes as I do. And my husband would never dare ask me how much they make. Right? Because I would never tell him. I'm like, I'm not going to, you know. So in his business, he'd never ask. You know, and I think, I was funny because I think we had our old master sergeant. I still can't call him by his first name. It's been 17 years. I can't do it. And um, so, but I did his and his wife's taxes last year. And uh, and so they came to the house and stuff. And I don't even know if my husband realized while they were there. Because he didn't, he didn't ask me any questions. Uh -huh. So, but, That's you know, cool. like I said, I just, you know, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm part counselor. To clients as well. I don't charge a different. I should charge like two rates at the same time. Yeah. So I have a simple question because okay. I, I really don't know much about all of this. So when I'm preparing my information on a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. do I need to choose between total miles or all the different expenses that go with my car or both? Are you preparing it or somebody else preparing it? I'm just preparing it for the accountant. Yeah, I How would give them both information and let okay. them pick. Okay. Is there so, usually one that's better than the other? Though? Well, um, but, you know, again, mileage is fifty-eight cents a mile. Mm -hmm. Usually, so, the mileage wins in our case. Sometimes, yeah. yeah so well, I it have, used to be like thirty-three right back three yeah. four years ago. Yeah, it's been a long. No, it's been longer than that. But if you start, yeah, can you start and change up the way that you deduct off of the same vehicle? You can't. Year? So you can't. I mean, you're really not supposed to. Like, you can get a new vehicle and change. Yes. Right, but you can't like one year pick depreciation and one year pick money, you know. On the same vehicle. Kind of, yeah, and and I actually have an AC client, and I write off the truck he drives. It doesn't even have his business name or anything on it. I write off his truck 100 percent because I know for a fact that when he when he and his girlfriend go somewhere, they're driving her Audi. Yeah. Because they live together, and I know that they're not driving his truck and stuff. But he's got his truck and he's got his work vans and everything, 
I, but I know, and you know, because we've been he's been a client a long time. I you know, I know that information if the IRS ever asks and stuff. You know. Well, I, it's neat to have the so. apps then. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yeah. So okay. easy. Okay. And they'll actually send you a monthly report. You can print it out, and then okay. begin of the year. So okay. even if it was fifty, receipts, yeah. So if you think about it, fifty thousand. Let's say you drove. 40,000 miles a year, right? And it was 50 cents a mile. That's $20,000 you can write off in expenses, right? For your, off your auto. And then you go, well, what's my gas and stuff? Okay, well, you know, you're, I mean, you're, you're getting, depending on what you're driving, you're getting anywhere between, you know, probably, if you're realtors, you're probably not driving a gas guzzler, hopefully. Yeah, you get 24 miles to the gallon. Yeah. I do have a client, I do actually have a client who has two vehicles. He's got a Cadillac, which is an older, it's an older Escalade, and he's got a beat up piece of crap. And when he's taking clients around, he's driving the Escalade. Mm -hmm. Every other business thing he's driving is beat up piece of crap because it gets better gas mileage than an Escalade does. But it's an ex like it's a an appearance thing. Success. And the see, point. for me, I think the success yeah. is. My dad said he could have bought. He was a dentist. He says I could have bought a Jaguar or a BMW, but he retired at fifty six. Oh. Because he bought a thirty thousand dollar car instead of a sixty thousand uh dollar -huh. car. And I go the same thing. I'm like I. I drive a Hyundai two. I drive a Hyundai two, and, and again, I'm you know I'm I'm practical. I'm Cheapest analytical. Mercedes I can find. <laughs> <laughs> so they've got a great warranty. Yeah. So when, when you expense a piece of equipment like mm -hmm. a vehicle, mm -hmm. does it have to be 100% used for the business? No. Mm -hmm. So if you've got if you spend twenty thousand dollars on a vehicle and it's half usage, you can appreciate ten thousand dollars over five years. I mean expense up front. There was a number for it. Uh, Section one seventy nine. There's limits. There's rules. So to take a 179, which is a so the, so they have 179, and then they actually had bonus. So a bonus was 50 percent. Last year they made bonus 100 percent. And the difference between a 100 percent bonus and a section 179 bonus is that uh, deduction where you get the same amount off is bonus. You could throw yourself your business into a loss to, and take it. You can't take the section 179 for a piece of equipment and throw yourself into a loss. Mm -hmm. And I picked up a new client last year because he gave me his taxes. He's like, I don't like this. Like, they're showing this really big loss. And I'm like, well, the returns like that. The numbers are right. But the problem was, was they took the bonus depreciation on a bunch of assets he had just bought. He bought a bunch of these does signs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And for people who pay cash, I highly recommend writing it off. But if you finance a piece of equipment, why would you take the full write-off in this year? Because in the next four years, four or five years, you're going to be outlaying cash for a payment, and you're not going to get any offsetting deduction, and then you're going to have cash flow problems. Okay. I always, I let them pick. So that's I always what told they did. Them, yeah, they and so, so he did He took, they took it all up front and didn't ask him, and he didn't want to do that. So I went back and I redid all the returns, and I elected not to take the bonus, okay. and. You know, and so he's going to get to write these assets off over the next couple of years. He still didn't owe any money to the IRS. And a reasonable loss at that moment. <laughs> well, he didn't even have, and all he did, he didn't have a loss he just didn't want to owe because at this point now he's filing a return late mm -hmm. and stuff. And again, you you guys know if somebody comes to you and they've got a scheduled speed and they're showing a fifty thousand dollar loss every year, they get in the house if that's their only income. No. <laughs> so I have a question about something along the same line here. Um, Actually, it's a little bit different, but it applies to realtors. Most, uh, as whenever we're whenever we're working with our clients and they ask us about investment properties, uh -huh. uh, we we have some investment properties, and historically, it's been great uh -huh. because you know it's just been really good to have a couple of investment properties for our own tax returns. Is there anything that we're needing to be careful about? Recently, and as you see it on the horizon, as far as the value of investment properties. Well, you no, know, I mean the, the only thing you run into is if historically people used to buy properties for the losses, right? Mm -hmm. But once your income's over one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars, you can't take these losses. Okay. So those are things to watch out for. Of course, you know I would never want to buy something where I mean, if if I have a tax loss and I'm a cash flow positive, I'm okay with I'd be okay with that. But I don't want to buy a I don't want to buy an investment thing. I mean, I get upset at my financial advisor. I'm like, why is this account down 5%, right? I would do the same thing. Like, why I put, I 
and outlaying all this money, you know, and if you're getting no benefit for it, I mean, no current, you don't or lose it. Or a small it. percentage of return. Right. So I tell clients, I go, at least the good news is, is if you're accumulating, I have clients that accumulate a couple hundred thousand dollars of losses on their rental properties. And I go, they don't go away. They're just suspended until your rental properties either start making a profit or you sell it. So you don't actually lose them. They just hang out on a form and carry over from year to year until one of the other things triggers the ability to take the loss. So if you, so if you sell the property, you can take those losses and sometimes that's almost nice because if you've got an accumulated asset or you've got an asset that you've been depreciating, mm -hmm. having those losses mm -hmm. can offset some of that gain. And how long will the losses accumulate? Till you die. Really? And so then your heirs get to step up. So it's not like a five year, if I, if, if I take five years of losses and sell it five years later, I, I haven't gained or lost anything. It just keeps on going. That's right. Okay. Yeah, it's not. It's not like some of the. It's not like some of the losses where you only have so many years to. If it's depreciable property, though, you have to recapture it, don't you? Some of it. Some of the How depreciation. How about one seventy nine? You have to recapture anything there. Well, on one seventy nine, you can't like you can't buy like a building in one seventy nine. Right. It has to be equipment. Yeah, equipment. So. To us, to us, it'd be our vehicle. Yes. So, yeah. So, if you were to, if you were to sell the vehicle, for, you know, you buy it for twenty and you sell it for ten, and you depreciated it down to zero, you have to pay tax on the ten. But if you buy a vehicle for twenty personally, and then you sell it for ten later, you don't get to take a loss. That's the heads they win, tails you lose, IRS. Because if you have a personal asset and you gain money on a sale, they want you to pay taxes on it. Right. But if you have, but if you take a loss, you can't. It's, it's your loss. Yeah. Exactly. And they also did away with like moving expenses. I don't know if you guys know that. That might be good information mm -hmm. for your um, clients. For your clients who are moving. Yeah. That was big, mm -hmm. right? If we, if we pay, there are several real estate companies in the area that pay to assist people in moving mm -hmm. locally. Okay. That can become an expense to them. To you guys, yeah. To the realtor. So, so if there's a way, so it might be because are you? Can you charge more than three percent commission? Oh okay. yeah, you charge whatever. whatever you so you could, so you well. could negotiate a higher commission mm -hmm. and pay the and pay their moving, mm -hmm. right? Well, yeah. and then so they're really paying for it. So they're so they're paying for yeah. it, but you get to take it off. Right. Oh, and they but they can deduct uh, commissions, can they, off of the value uh, sale? Depending on, you know, if it's an investment property yeah. or whatever, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Remember Nate Martinez? He was oh, the yeah. first one I seen him buy a van yeah. and lend it to his clients to move with. Yeah. <laughs> and well, he had all his advertisement on that absolutely. van. Absolutely. Yeah. He's still in business. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He is. So does that, so he, do people right. call, like, I always wonder, like, how many, I mean, I've, I've never been behind somebody and gone, Gee, I've always needed a house cleaner. Like I'm behind this van, I'm going to call. Like yeah. I don't know. I mean, I just don't know if how effective that is that advertising. at advertising and stuff. And um, I don't do so. I'm in a networking group, and then I'm in, and not because I, I don't pay for it. So if you know what Coffee News is, if there's some of those restaurants. Okay. Yeah. So if you go to some in the West, like in Glendale and stuff, I'm in some of those, and I do the guy's bookkeeping for free he couldn't afford to pay me to do his books and it's too expensive for me to, to because it's like 57 50 a week mm. and I'd have to get eight clients every year at my average price just to break even yeah on the deal and I've gotten some and I've actually gotten some pretty decent ones yeah. but it's just not really been worth it but again we trade out yeah yeah you know and and Technically, that's the IRS would want me to include the value of my bookkeeping service. It's you know. no bartering, huh? <laughs> You're supposed to claim bartering income. Yeah. I'm going, okay, whatever. So I claim that, but then I would write off my advertising as a wash. But So that one's not really that big of a deal. But I also, I do, I barter with a masseuse. Oh, I like that She one. just, she needs bookkeeping. <laughs> she can't afford to pay me the bookkeeping price. So she trades out one massage every month. Win-win. Uh, right? So. Okay. So is there a general rule then uh, when it comes to like our percent of check that we can give back justifiably? Is like as like a concession? Or yeah, or like gifts or like whatever to our clients. Like in the end, 
Like if, if they it, like if they see that let's say we got like a four thousand dollar check and then this year we gave out you know two thousand dollars per sale. That's a little like in wonky. Gifts. Yeah, well, see, like when it comes gift. to the moving and stuff like that, but like see, to what extent would, can you? Well, I would call. See, and I wouldn't call, call that else. gifts, right? Well, I would call everything. like when we when we moved, like our realtors, they they he sent a flower, like the fruit mm -hmm. thingy, yeah. whatever yeah, that is, the the edible, or edible, edible oh, arrangements or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. But for you, if you're paying for moving, I'm gonna call that concessions. What exactly is that? Mean. So, because the I can't say I've ever kept a concession side on my taxes. So I have a client who I write off as an expense. She's got a line item called concession. So something they gave, she either agreed to fix something or whatever she needed to do to get that deal closed. Oh, like if we oh, pay so for a fridge like or something home like that. Yeah. Homeowner, yeah. Homeowners oh. uh, insurance. Yeah. So I just call that like a concession and okay. stuff and because a a, because gifts. Are like are limited to basically like twenty five dollars. Think if you don't have a receipt or whatever yeah. per yeah. person per person, and it's okay. got you know. And again, like because um, it used to be, you know, they go um, if someone was trying, you know, like if um, you took a client to Las Vegas for the weekend or whatever, you know, and you're looking at what the value of what you gave is is to their overall. Um, what they're already earning, right? So like they like for us we have rules too on what we can accept. Yeah. So we can't accept something that would be out like would you know, like I couldn't accept a client, you know, or a, somebody giving me a car. Yeah. You know, a fifty thousand dollar car mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right? But you know, if a, if a client gives me a fifty dollar gift certificate, that's nominal to me. You know, so that's so that's okay. But right? that's twenty five dollars over the limit. Well, but well, but, you know, I'm, but for me, I'm thinking, you know, like just a regular client, yeah. like a first, like yeah. just a regular. See, what we run into in this business is that we'll have, uh, we often hear the twenty-five dollar thing, mm -hmm. and yet we're in a business where, you know, our commissions uh, can be tens of thousands of dollars, right. and that twenty-five dollars is almost a slap in the face mm -hmm. when, and so we have to figure out a way to make it a little bit more reasonable. And I like that idea of concessions mm -hmm. because. Most of, I know that Charlotte and I often will we as part of what we do we just we pay for the home warranty mm -hmm. hundreds of dollars you know yep. five hundred bucks or more and uh, mm -hmm. or we'll eat up we'll we'll concede a, a thousand or two thousand dollars just to get the sale yeah, yeah. You know? I'd rather have the five hundred bucks in the home warranty because man we had a a, le a main line plumbing leak oh. and it wasn't covered it wasn't covered by the home you, apparently you could have done an add on yep. didn't know yeah. that. Yep. And it also wasn't covered by our homeowners because it was outside. It's right between the two. Yeah. Oh, so we had to have, yeah, and it was under That's concrete. Expensive. It was a big, yes. yeah, it was, yes. so. so is, is that like, the word we use? It's concessions. concessions. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, my parents, when they had their house built, they actually put the, uh, because they knew that the city is responsible for the line from the meter mm -hmm. yes. on. To the meter is on their house. Oh. Good call. Yeah. So anything is the city's problem. Yeah. So could it be a cash <laughs> What? The concession could have been cash. You mean like if you're giving them cash? Uh, no, I can would, it be? I wouldn't give them. I wouldn't give them cash necessarily. Any service? Yeah, How service or or, or or a gift that, card to Home Depot. If you give them cash, that almost, that almost comes under the category of bribe. Huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I have, I have clients who are like, they're like, don't give me an invoice. I'm just gonna pay you in cash. I'm like, look, it's going to the bank anyway. And I go because they're not gonna go to jail over a couple thousand dollars. That's right. In tax right. prices, like it's not worth it. You know, so pay me your hundred hundreds if you want. And then I go, what does the bank must think I do for a living when I'm dropping off hundred dollar bills and deposits and stuff? I'm like, it's a exchange it for a bunch of ones. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I think it's 20s now. I don't think they do for ones. Quick question. I had a realtor up in Washington mm -hmm. refer me a client. Okay. And he said rather than go through our typical relocation department mm -hmm. and everybody has to pay more to the relocation than they actually receive, he said, why don't you just buy me a thousand dollar gift card to Amazon? Mm. So can I put that in That's the same thing as giving them a thousand dollars. See, oh, see to me, to me, because that's a realtor, uh -huh. that falls under the. Can I want to give you a ten ninety nine for that thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would want to do. If it was five hundred bucks, 
I would, you know what I'm saying, if it's under that $600 limit mm -hmm. per year, mm -hmm. if it's a one-time deal, I'd be like, let me give you $600 or $575 or whatever, and you could still write it off and I'll have to 1099 him. Yeah, He's still supposed to claim it, but that's his I think problem. it actually violates the, the typical rules because all brokers, it's, mm -hmm. it's removed. It's, it's payment to him, and it all yeah. has to go to brokerage. Yeah. And it come, I pay the taxes on it. And you pay it, yeah, yeah. probably. But yeah. by doing it that way, he was asking you to violate NAR rules. So you could lose your license and over... Bypass the uh, broker. It's, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's probably it's more of a slap on the hand. Because you think you're yeah. doing a but, but, he, but he did it. He's the one that initiated yeah. that, which says, whoa, you know, is he even a realtor now? But... <laughs> And did it actually? Did you actually get the deal? Did it close and everything? Oh yeah. Wow. Well, that's good. Because I a mean, lot he of referred time... patient. You know, he referred his clients from Washington because they're buying down here. Yeah. 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 It's just bypassing yeah. the broker. Yeah, he, he, it should have gone to his broker technically. Yeah. That was that was the only truly okay. bad. Don't thing ever about do that, that again, right? <laughs> well, but well, he's the one that's going to get in trouble, not you, right? When well, when the doubt pays the broker, when the doubt pays the broker. Because again, I mean, that, now they have the taxes, whatever your guys' unless, rules are for your license, you know, you guys, you don't yeah. want to, I mean. Unless he's a broker. Yeah. They're all brokers yeah. up there. They are. Yeah. yeah. That might be a loophole then for them. I, no, I, no, no, it's, no. It, it's, it's, that's just kind of splitting hairs. Literally, the brokerage. Yeah. Literally every penny a realtor makes is technically the brokerages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so every form of payment to anybody has to be should be paid to the brokerage, mm -hmm. not necessarily that agent. Because so the agent yeah. has to hang his license with, with the brokerage. With exactly. the brokerage. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And every listing, every sale, it's we're facilitating it, but it's technically the brokerage's mm -hmm. whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of weird, wonky things with well, that one. Unless they have different rules in Washington. Yeah. Well, I asked him, I says, how can I, how, how can I get away with that? I says, you know, because now I'm paying the taxes on it. He says, oh, well, just say you're giving away a $150 gift card at every open house that you have. And I'm thinking, but that's a lie. I can't lie. Yeah. That's right. I can't yeah. lie. I'm sorry. Oh, I already oh. have issues. So. Yeah, okay. and, again, and again, you go down to, okay, without, you know, the, the whether I can, if you want to write that off, it's like, okay, he, he would be needing to claim that anyway, yeah. Yeah. right? And stuff, mm -hmm. and he okay, so But he's not, I bet he, he's not claiming. Probably I, not, yeah. you know. Okay. Yeah, and I tell clients, I'm like, oh. I, I said, I, I go, you know what the IRS said, I don't that. care if it's cash. Mm -hmm. I go, you know that y you claim all income, right? It doesn't matter if the client gives you cash. What if somebody gave you like a prized poodle? <laughs> Why would you want that? Oh. <laughs> it seems like... Seems like can, maintenance can write, to me. Yeah, can I write off the cat my client made me take because it gave birth the night she took possession of her home? <laughs> Aaron, that for the concession? Uh huh. That's this put on the item in your book. <laughs> yeah, I just do it as a, yeah, it's just an other deduction. That's um, how we you know. And what you never want to do is write, like, we had, I picked up the clients, um, we didn't do the, we did not do the accounting. They got audited for a year, we didn't do, they had just already, they moved over to us. The tax professional accounting firm or whatever it was, they put a line item Porsche lease ninety six thousand dollars. Spelled lease? it out, nanny nanny. I drive a Porsche. Yeah. And this is a pain doctor. And I said, you need to get ready to write a check. <laughs> I'm like thirty grand. Put that number in your head because I'm thinking that's the number, right? So he has an S corp and a personal return. I said, once they get done looking at the S corp, they're going to go to your personal return. Mm -hmm. but they're going to nail you. And to make it worse, the day, so I went to the audit, and they were auditing, and they went to his office to look at his records. Oh, dear. Yeah. She had her supervisor there reviewing her doing her job. And I'm like, buddy, you are in trouble. So I was just there to be the intermediary, so he didn't say anything. All said and done. They come back and they want to give him $1,200 because they messed up on his basis calculation. I was like, sign it, sign it, sign it. <laughs> I'm like, it is wrong, but once you sign it and they sign it, they cannot go back. Mm -hmm. I go, but they made a giant mess mm -hmm. out of this audit. I said, you should have paid heavily for that. And I tell clients, I'm like, I'm not saying you can't write off your lease, <coughs> but I wouldn't be so bold as to spell it out on the line item, this is what I'm writing off. And again, I go back to that. What is that? Is that law firm going to write off that hundred twenty-five thousand dollars? Of course they are. Mm -hmm. They're just going to put it somewhere else yes. and not put it under entertainment. Right. Is there a difference between an actual like 
then car payment payment and a, and a lease for like because uh, if it's used primarily well, if, for business coming from ignorance okay as a brokerage are we going to be able to eventually like how does that work i've never as a realtor i just write off my stuff yeah vehicles and yeah how does you that could, yeah work? you could own and if you owned like five vehicles or whatever then you have to take the actual expenses you can't take mileage anymore now here's here's where we have issues being an s corp or a partnership return versus a sole proprietor because the IRS wants to say that if that vehicle is not in the business name, you can write off mileage, you can't write off the expenses, which means you can't 179 that vehicle. Unless it's time but in the business. Here's why you don't put here's why people don't put it in the company's name, because now it's a commercial vehicle and their insurance rates go up. Uh, and they don't want to do that. I and I go, well, don't tell me who owns it. But if you get audited, I'm telling you, they may yeah. disallow this. And that 179 for the vehicle, we call they changed. We called it the Hummer Law. I don't know if you remember that. So because when this first came out and they moved it from a twenty-five thousand dollar limit or whatever to now is a hundred, whatever it is, people were buying Hummers oh, okay. and writing them off, right? Mm -hmm. And that was not really what it was for. And I had somebody call me and and a, a CPA colleague of mine, and she's like. A, a, she says a, a Toyota Tundra counts, right? And I go, no, a Toyota Tundra is like a Ford F-150. Yeah. So this, the rule is 6,000 pounds or greater. What hits that? A Ford F-250, you know, or a, 25, a Dodge 2500 or whatever. I says these half tons or bigger are the ones that are going to qualify. This Toyota Tundra, it's not going to, it doesn't count. It goes by the gross vehicle weight. It goes by the gross vehicle weight, right? And you know. And then there's pat, and then there's you know because they consider everything else like a luxury vehicle, and not like it's a luxury vehicle, yeah. Yeah. but that's and there's a certain so you can take like eighteen thousand dollars on a first year for a luxury vehicle, but if you spend fifty thousand dollars on it, you take eighteen the first year, you depreciate the rest over the next four years. Whereas if you spend a fifty thousand dollars on an F two fifty and it was a hundred percent business for you, you could write it all off on that one year. Again, if you pay cash. If you don't pay cash, I still don't recommend it. So is that an accelerated depreciation instead of a uh, table? Well, I mean, you it's it's two hundred percent double declining, you know, balance is usually because you've got that or straight line and stuff. But I usually only use straight line on like a building or that kind of stuff, and then you have to. Can you set your office up in here? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not actually that far because I'm just because you guys are just south of Bell a little yeah. bit. So, nice. freeways like you can go 11 miles and it'll take you 18 minutes. You can go 7 miles and it'll take you 18 minutes. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, I'll pick the 7 miles, thank you. I want to go out of my way. So, um, it's so it's cool that you can drive through town. Oh, yeah. oh my gosh, but the wear and tear on the car, yeah. you know. So I just highway miles. Yeah. Highway, highway miles. Mile. I know. I just <laughs> my old, I just I'm trying to like my old car was for a couple of years when my son he, we, he went out of district. So I was driving like eight miles to his school, diagonally to my office, and then home every day. And I put so many miles on it that it was it was ridiculous. And my son's been driving it, and he's now he's in Florida. It's got eight months where it's not going to be driven very often. But maybe we can start to catch up on what should be the mileage on this vehicle. She has to have the oil changed every two weeks. <laughs> So well now it's now because it's synthetic oil it's five thousand miles. There's a there's a courier guy. Um, forget where he is. I think he's in Canada. He's had the same um, Toyota little pickup truck since I think the it's like an eighty four, and he's been driving that same truck for years. And he it's like the world record for pickups. And he's it's got millions of miles on it. And I think he's on like his third engine, but. Too many Christmas. <laughs> I know, and I don't really, I'm not, I'm not really fond of driving like far. And usually, I do have several clients who, um, right towards the end of tax season, I actually will deliver tax returns to a, a bunch of people. And what I do is there's usually like maybe ten or twelve, and I put it in MapQuest. Yes. And then MapQuest right. orders it for me. Oh. And then I just call the clients and go, here's your window. Of when I'm going to be there to sign, you know, and it's usually on whatever date that it, because a lot of them are older and they've got the golf, like some got, usually falls on some golf tournament or whatever. <laughs> and when I go and I just drive, because I have a couple in um, Vistancia yeah. and Trilogy. Mm -hmm. Have you sold homes in Trilogy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That is the coolest place. 
I go, every time I go in there and those doors open, I'm like this instant <laughs> calm comes over yeah. me. It's just, yeah. I don't know what it is, it's just tranquil in there. And I guess I could. They said they have to sell so many mm -hmm. to under 55. Mm -hmm. There's like a percentage that they had to have, so there are some youngsters in there. Not that 55 is, you know, but so. Um, it, it's age restricted. It's age restricted. Yeah, so they, yeah. had to, they had to let like a certain um, window. Of, yeah, 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 a certain mm -hmm. one was in there, but. One of my clients said, because they had a lot of homes for sale, like, after a year or two, mm -hmm. because their HOA dues are so expensive right. that people, when they were moving in, they weren't thinking about that, and they're on a fixed income yeah. and stuff. And But, I mean, it, like, yeah, yeah, the amenities yeah. there are amazing. Yeah, yeah amazing. Awesome. If yeah, it could just fun. include somebody coming to clean my house, because I've had clients that live in, like, um, the Madison, some retirement communities, mm -hmm. and the lady's like, yeah, they clean my house three days a week, and they do my laundry, and they wash my towels, and I get three meals a day, and I'm like, delightful, can we just add our ages together and then <laughs> qualify to move in? Because that sounds really nice. Yeah. yeah. And I had a realtor yeah, last night tell me, she's like, you just need to pay to have a housekeeper come in and stuff, because it's 9.30, and I'm, she's calling me at 9.30 at night, and, and um, uh, I'm folding laundry. She's like, to do your laundry? And I'm like, I don't really want somebody to do my laundry. <laughs> I go, and the dishes are kind of cathartic sometimes. You know, sometimes yes. coming to make dust, I guess. I don't know. And if I need steps, I sweep. Don't mess with my mess. I know. I can't do mess. Like, we moved into our house, and that day all the boxes were empty. Oh. Because I can't, come to my house. I can't focus and clutter. Like, I had I was had so much stuff going on last week, and, like, I have a desk and, like, others, all this stuff in my office. And Friday, before I started working, I'm like, okay. Stuff I'm doing, I'm gonna order this all because I just it got it got to be too distracting to having all and because working from home I can't see those boxes it would drive me crazy and stuff I and think that's where we're getting is to a place where we're still trying to move in yeah but I do actually before we move because my husband goes let's just go through stuff when we get to the new house I was like no. I began. just leave it in place till the statue of limitations. Uh, that's what I said. I said, I, 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 then I throw it away. We have, we have three piles. We have going to the new house, going yes, to Salvation Army, and going to the trash. Yes. yes. And we have, I paid an organizer, best mm -hmm. 100 bucks I spent. She's $25 an hour. She came in and helped me go through stuff. And she's like, do you have all of this I Love Lucy stuff because people just know you love I Love Lucy and they just buy you crap? Or did you like buy it because you want, I'm like, yeah, the first one. She's like, okay, <laughs> goodwill, goodwill. Like, we get, I mean, it was so free and I don't have attachments to things like my husband does. That's Lucy of all, man. Well, I know. I do have, I mean, I have, I do have some stuff. Like, I still have a bottle of this. They're Red Hots, but they're biting the veterans. And it's probably like 20 years old. And they say there's no, no, they don't outlive them. They say it's silly, but it's still good to eat. Well, I mean, the, but it would ruin the, yes. you know, no, 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 what's no, in no, the no. bottle, yes. so I yes. just keep them in there. But, again, I don't like a lot of, like, knickknacks and, and, and that kind of stuff. It's just, to me, again, it's a, it's a well, distraction. Or they have to dust. Or so, have to dust, and my, par well, my parents go, good lord, their house has yeah. lots of Silly yeah. question right before, because uh, we're about 11.30. Okay. So, if you had to give a quick guide to the, the main items as a realtor that we should definitely make sure we're keeping track of, mm -hmm. what would they be overall? Okay. Keep track of your miles. Okay. Because even if you're taking actual expenses, you still yeah. have to know what portion is business what, of your miles was business and what was not. Yeah. And then, um, you want to keep track of your the meals and stuff. And, and you want, like I said, you want to keep track of, of this, you know, stuff separate. Okay. This would be um, advertising, marketing, is yeah. that what you said? Mm -hmm. okay. Business promotions. Business promotions. Something like that. Um, and again, because you're looking at where am I getting, you know, meals, I'm only getting half. Yeah. This way you can write all of that off. So. And that would go into concessions? No, I, no, I would, no, I would just no, call that business, business concessions. Is anything that you would give back to your clients your to back. get the help the deal. Yeah, basically. to get that deal closed, I would call it yeah. concession. And for you guys, you know, I'm seeing, you know, the MLS dues, the super keys, mm -hmm. those kind of, yeah. any kind of subscriptions you've got. If you've got stuff. your professional yes. licenses, your, your renewals, your continuing education, anything. That was one question I did have for you. Um, like when it comes to like uh, my coaching, for example, uh, coaching itself is like it is a, an expense, like education type thing, mm -hmm. right? Okay, so when it comes to traveling, and I've always, I have a feeling I've never done it right. 
okay? So is there a benefit to, for example, like flying as opposed to driving when it comes to like business trips? Am I still trying to minimize all my expenses or like is everything while I'm there? <sighs> trips are just confusing to me. I don't know what else I'm allowed to use and not because technically I'm there. So my food and everything, but yes. I still have to eat anyway. So I. <laughs> so food still yes, but again, if you take your wife, she's no. Okay. Her airfare is no. Okay. But they're not charging anymore for the hotel rooms because we don't do that anymore, unless you're staying at one of those places you don't want to stay at. And then your the rental car, you're going to have no matter what. And for driving, it depends on how far you're driving, right? Like, am I going to drive to Los Angeles or am I going to fly? I'm probably going to drive because by the time I go to the airport, we try to drive the hour to the airport, yeah. two hours early, the hour flight, I'm mean, at five but hours. You write off all those miles. You write off all those miles. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Keep right. track of those too. Yes. Yeah, so I have to travel a certain distance from my home in order to uh, say uh, claim a motel. And what if like I'm, you're going down the street, or like, <laughs> like, is there a business purpose for the hotel? Like, it has to be a no, business. Say I own a business 200 miles from here. Okay. And I have to stay overnight. Okay. Yes. yes. That's a direct write off. Yes. He has an RV part. Okay. And, yeah. And my meals. And you gotta go there every once in a while to check on it. And my meals while I'm eating mm -hmm. out away yep. from home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is the general? Uh, is it more like what is it? Seventy? What's the minimal for it to be like classified as uh, like far enough? away, isn't it? Um, you mean like from my, just where I live to my work? Yeah, because like even mean? he could get a second, like isn't there like a way to get like a second home near wherever you're at if you have like a business there and that's still a write off or something like that? I, I don't know, or like a place to stay or a condo or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. Because um, like if he used part of part of his facility as, as a place or whatever, wouldn't... Um, well, see, I, I write off all the business yeah. expense of the RV park and if you, separately and, from my real estate. Business. And you should. Yeah. But if you, yeah, but if you are, if you bought a trailer and it's up there or whatever, I would say, I would say if it's more than a half a day's drive, like if I've got, if it's far enough away that I would, that it makes sense to stay overnight. Yeah. But like if I had a place in... Prescott or Sedona or Scottsdale, okay. yeah. I can't really justify buying and having yeah. a house over there because I mean, really, I got you know, it's 90 minutes, right? Yeah, you know, it's not a big deal. But if I've got something in Texas or you know, or maybe, um, but the fact that the White Mountains is like four hours away, yeah, and to me, that's a full day, right? You wouldn't want to go there. I mean, you go there, you have to turn and come right, that, right back. It's not feasible. I mean, it's not. It's yeah, doable, but it's not pleasant at all. No, I mean, you wouldn't you would be, I mean, because you have to get up super early, right? To yeah. conduct any kind of business yeah, and then come home. Yeah, and I would say that that would probably I had left at 2 o'clock in the morning, yeah. Oh, that's And turn around. Right. Hopefully my husband's driving at that point and I'm, sleep, I'm just sleeping and stuff. But yeah, I, you know, again. But the quarters I use up there is not a uh, equipment, right? If it's a, say it's a double-wide mobile home. Mm -hmm. You couldn't run 79 that, could you? Nope. Mm -mm. No, because it's still a residence. No. But you could depreciate it, though. Yeah, over, well, if you're using it commercially, you're 39 years. So mm -hmm. a $39,000 trailer, you're getting $1,000 a year or whatever. So, yeah, I mean, it's still, you know, dollars a dollar. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, so. I never so, have depreciated because I don't want to reclaim, I don't want to recapture. Well, here's, but here's the rule. You know what the rule is on depreciation, right? It's allowed or allowable. On that recapture, that's the rule. Oh, no kidding. I'm yes. going to pay for it anyway? It's allowed or allowable. You're going to pay for it anyway. You might as well take well, it. that's news. Mm -hmm. Yes. That, that, is their, that is their rule. So just because you didn't take depreciation does not mean you don't have to recapture the part that you should have taken. Can yeah. you go back? Shoot. It's interesting. You, yeah. you, I yeah. mean, you can only go back a couple of years and amend. Um, I've had some ones where I've kind of been like, well, maybe let's take a little extra of these next couple of years to try and kind of catch up. Is it right? Eh, I don't know if the IRS can. You still do a cost basis then? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, but if you leave it, if you plan to leave it to your heirs, they're gonna get a step up when you die. So. Or is there um, and probably a different topic. Have you done much with when it comes to reverse mortgages or anything like that yet? Do those affect people? Um. I mean, I know some people that have done reverse mortgages, and I know a yeah. person that 
sells reverse mortgages. Yeah. But I mean, there's no write-off. Are there write -off. any tax repercussions? Yeah, because you're not because you're losing all the benefits of your home at that point in time, aren't you? Pretty well, much. yeah, but if but I guess for some people, like my mortgage interest yeah. was you know on yeah. our three hundred and some odd thousand dollar house was ten thousand dollars last year because we had a three and a quarter interest rate. Yeah. So we have no we. I mean, this is the first year we're not going to itemize. Wow. On the federal, like that's so, you know, wow. so 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 to yeah. looking at then from from a buyer's perspective, uh -huh. because of, uh -huh. of what some of the changes are, is it still like because we we like to show seriously. you know that you it, it's in your best interest <laughs> you actually save money tax wise yeah. yeah. to buy so houses versus like renting. So do we right. still yes. have based on the changes? Is, is no, but you still, still have. At the end of the day, if you rent for 30 years and you die, you have nothing. Yeah. Yeah. If you own a house for 30 years and you die, you have an asset. Yeah. Or if you have a house for 30 years and you need to go into assisted living, income when you, get older, exactly. you can sell yes. it and you've Absolutely. got that asset. If you rent it for 30 years and you need to go to assisted living, guess what? You're still renting, yeah. Yeah. but just some are more expensive. Right up and you the have no asset, yeah. you know. Up until the 80s. 60% of an of a average person's net worth when they, when they retired was their home, mm -hmm. right up until yeah. the 80s when we got all wonky about owning homes. Well, you know, it's funny. So <laughs> interest rates, too, um, you know, back in the 80s, you know, 12, 16% was what yes. you were paying as an interest yes. rate on your yes. mortgage yes. and stuff. So, you well, know, versus now, it's... Well, that was a reverse mortgage, mortgage mm -hmm. too. They well, were only going to lend you a percentage of your equity. That's correct. You've got to put in X amount of dollars. So if you want a four hundred thousand dollar house, you got to put in two hundred thousand dollars of equity, yes. or something like that. So, so your equity is what you're taking back out of it, and mm -hmm. I don't think that's taxable. No. Mm -hmm. So um, now, if you work from home, mm -hmm. what items do you really need to um, track in the take the home office deduction? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can either do five dollars a square foot. And have no receipts and keep track of nothing. That's been dedicated room. Dedicated room, which means no bed, no no clothes in the closet, and if there are, there better not be when you take a photo, and there better not be when the IRS comes to visit you. <laughs> now, I actually, I have we turned our front bedroom into an office. We cut a hole in the living room wall. We put in French doors so that way they can go through the living room and go to my office. I have an assistant who works two, three days a week. She sits in the living room. I basically took over the living room. Like we do not use that for personal at all. So I use from the one wall to the door jam. That is my office. Oh, okay. And um, you can take, and this is the nice thing about the fact that with the um, fact the standard deduction so high, you can take a portion. I think I think it's I'm somewhere around ten percent of my house. Um, so that's real estate taxes, mortgage insurance. Um, in addition to the five dollars, it's either or. So five dollars, you have to keep track of nothing. So if you have a thousand, uh, you know, hundred square foot, it, I think you, you get five hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So or you can, you know, real, it's mortgage interest, real estate taxes, the insurance, and the utilities. And I never include computer, internet, and utilities because I write that off so separately. Right. Because I use, I write off about. Well, now I'm writing off. I bought Cox Business. I'm writing off pretty much all of it because literally. I'm on that computer 95% of my day for business. My husband might come around and look at Craigslist for like an hour when he gets home, but that's, I mean, we don't use it, and we don't even pay, we don't have, we have direct TV. So that gets written off, I, I pay for it out of the personal account and stuff. And then I tell clients, and if you have an LLC and everything, you want to run everything through the business account. Transfer money to your personal account to pay for your personal stuff. You don't want to commingle. I go to Target and I buy pro stuff for the house and stuff for the office. I make them do two orders. Here's yeah. my business card, here's my personal card. Yeah. Yeah. Amazon. I have to remind my son if you are buying something on Amazon that I agreed to pay for, you make sure you use the card that ends in these four digits <laughs> because this other one is my business card and I'm tired of having to make a journal entry in my QuickBooks as a draw because you put it to the wrong. You use the wrong cart. I'm like, I'm yeah. trying to keep this clean here. So if the IRS ever comes and says, let me see your Amazon, mm -hmm. no problem. You can, I, I, I Amazon delivers to my house like every other day, it seems like, because I'm like, oh, today I need pens. Oh, Because I, I don't want to go out to the store. Yeah. In the summertime, it's mostly because it's hot. Yeah. But also, you know, I mean, it's 
it's like a half an hour, 45 minute trip where I can spend 30 seconds and, go, and, and like, order something on Amazon. Now oh. that $5 there, mm -hmm. is part of that considered depreciation and is it recaptured? No, that wouldn't be depreciation. So you don't have to, so that $5, well, that $5 rule, so you wouldn't have to depreciate. And But yes, if you do take depreciation on the house, there is a small recapture. The old way to do it was you just didn't take home office the year you sold it. And they thought that got you out of it, but or you switch accountants and they don't know what you did prior. I don't know. <laughs> so, um, but like for you guys though, you can't write off your home office because you've got an office location already. So. But my company's going to start charging us a desk fee regardless of whether mm -hmm. we work at home. If we come in at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but if I'm mostly at home and I only go in to say print, mm -hmm. Because they don't charge us for printing. I know how you can get out of it. How to get out of it? Join our firm. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brad. <laughs> um, I, you know, I do have some that have that small fee, and I write that off and okay. still take the home office because right. that's really more of like a broker fee, kind mm -hmm. of, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, after a while, you ask yourself, is it worth it? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, because if they're only if they're charging you twenty five dollars, if they and you got to drive, they have your time. How much is your time worth to drive there? And the mileage and the wear and tear on your car to save money on the ink and you know so. Well, I do like the camaraderie. So. Okay. Well, then there's there's I mean at least see. But I don't write off my miles from my house to there because I know my home office is at my house. Well, then you can right? from there to your brokerage. You can. Oh, I can. That's business. Oh, okay. And there to like okay. for you guys, it's once you get here you leave. Okay. Mm -hmm. Technically, right? And I mean, I had so the same guy who wrote off the Porsche lease every morning would go to the bank first. Oops. I think what we because added. he said the bank's right next to my house, so now I'm business from here to the office. Uh, that was his mentality. I think what okay. we ought to do is just send them a letter instead of a 1040, and just say because you are so wasteful and paid eight hundred dollars for a toilet seat, I'm not sending you any money more. I fully believe That's when they deal. say that they paid eight hundred dollars for a toilet seat. They paid fifty dollars for a toilet seat, and seven hundred fifty went to some black ops that I have no business knowing about, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> and I want to have a disclaimer here. I okay. am definitely going to send my friend in Washington a ten ninety nine, so I don't get in trouble. There you go. Good. That's good. a good idea. Oh yeah. Now good that idea. thank you for sharing that because I just trusted him. I'm just mm -hmm. too nice. Yeah, no. So funny. Trust but verify. Yeah. Is that? Uh, yeah, that's funny. You, you well, know, I'm from I, Washington. Well, see, I, I would, I would assume, because I get a lot from Washington and Minnesota and Wisconsin. Yeah. Because they're and, and they're usually retired. Minnesota transplants are everywhere. Yeah. Well, yes. They, and I, and you know what's <laughs> funny is, gosh, it must be expensive to live up in Minnesota too. So I have clients who come in and they're like, Washington they bring me their tax return and they pay $900 and it was like one of the most organized things I've ever seen. And I'm like, well, what's this $900 for? They're like, that's my tax prep. And I was like, whoa. Wow. I go, well, I'm going to charge you $300 because <laughs> my dad always said you charge a fair price and you'll always be busy. Yeah. And I can sleep at night. With that, I'm like, I probably could have charged them seven and they would have still been tickled. But I was like, that was not a $700 return. That's what I was wondering. Like, is it more expensive up there to, to, to live? Or, you know, well, you but got, they seem to have a. Of, like uh, the Wicklands. It's just, uh -huh. it's a gorgeous. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. But I think. It really is beautiful. beautiful. I am jealous yeah. of my. Yeah. I have some friends that are retired and they. they from Minnesota, so well, they're here in the wintertime and they're there uh -huh. in the summertime, and in the summertime they're going, ha ha, look at me, it's 70 degrees. Seasonally, there. it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, now I would want to be, like, one of my friends, her daughter's Washington. in Pennsylvania, she said it was uh, 22 uh, below with the uh, wind chill. Yeah. Her well, feet, she work. took a picture, she went outside That's and took a picture of the snow, and her feet stuck to the porch. I'm like, why would you do that? It's not a big Arizona, because I like the cold. My kids are still there, so I go back every year. And even though we deal with the hot, it's like, I, I, I still do that over the cold. I tell clients that in the summertime, I won't travel to you between the hours of 10 and 4. If you want, you come to me, because I'm not leaving my house. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. North. So, North um, yeah. all right. You can be else yes. you want because no, but you can, can I can I share yeah. your power? Yeah, My daughter just and her husband um, and down delete the like photos. Okay, cool. but everything else you're yes. welcome to share. Okay. Yeah. So, 
Um, yeah, yes. over there is twelve hundred dollars. Oh, a little wow. more I stuff. Guess that this is the one. This is the one where <laughs> it talks I said, about just, who applied to this um, to that rule for the oh three hundred fifteen thousand. Yeah. And all you it's guys have fallen here too. Them. So they say Long that. Man, I like so they specifically said asked, these people, and then they said any business where your assets are reputation is still the owner. Now, like an HVAC guy, that's not the same thing. What they're saying here is um, like uh, uh, like Michael Jordan, right? People are people are buying an Air Jordans because of his his name or whatever, right? So, so that's that's what that counts in or whatever. But you guys are up here, I think, under the brokerage services and stuff. So, um, but yeah, feel like yeah, feel free to share this and. Um, <laughs> Doing two jobs. You're not so proud. this is why no. this is why like, why should you use me if you're in this yeah. is why yeah. so proud mm -hmm. of right. Yeah, so I know I yeah. like I said I was from my networking group that really I talk about that. It's like and you're doing cancer research. <laughs> I actually had I had this I had this uh realtor flying I don't think country that a realtor and his right hand lady, I don't know if she's a realtor. But she like she taxes like it makes her sweat like she gets so nervous like she was telling us so when she came in for the first year I actually baked banana bread that morning so the house would smell like banana bread because you know they say when you're going to buy a house you cook big cookies or something right so I said okay well it's too early for cookies so I made banana bread that morning just so she would come in and hopefully relax and my son made like a welcome sign for her and stuff she still like was sweating like horribly. Now she's gotten a lot more relaxed and she doesn't sweat as much because the taxes made her so nervous and everything. And then I tell clients, like, if you get audited for whatever reason, like, I have a friend who I didn't do his taxes, but he's being audited and I'm going to go to the IRS on his behalf. I go, you never want to go to the initial meeting because you're going to sing like a bird. Whether or not you're even cheating or whatever, you're going to get so nervous, you're just going to be like, blah, 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 blah. And they're going to, and they might, you know, and where I can go, oh, I don't know, let me go ask the client. And then I'd go back and be like, okay, what happened, you know. So, like, again, it's not like you're lying, but you just, when you get nervous, you just start, like, we, we confessing were everything. Audited, uh, in, in, the, in the late 90s. Nothing good and, comes from uh, talking. I'm it was guess. through yeah. no fault of ours. <laughs> but back then, and Michael can test, it was the most horrendous experience that you you just know you're going to lose everything mm -hmm. and and it, we were just so thrilled that that's when a, a monsoon storm came through and literally demolished our house because it's like we were we thought you know and we ended up well I had it was so, not a good experience I had, I had so many was coming from their hand. kid 30 years later it's uh it's it was the most yeah. Well, I had some, yeah. I had some clients that I did fifth, I did sixteen. I didn't do their fifteen. I didn't do their seventeen because in seventeen she became a realtor and some guy came and talked and said, "Come use me because I'm a realtor special." I'm like, well, "There's not really any special laws that are different between realtors and everybody else. There's not. There's just not whatever." So they got audited for the year. That, they got audited for the year that I did because their income was so much higher. I'm like, "You're auditing them for the year they paid the most taxes." I'm like, "Interesting." So she asked me, I'm like, yeah, no problem, I'll take care of the auto, you do nothing, you, you don't show up, whatever. I gathered all the information the lady asked for, she asked me some questions, and I said, well, honestly, their income's a lot higher because they did some work for a church at the end of the year that they don't normally do. Okay. And I thought for sure I had overstated their mileage because when we guessed the mm -hmm. mileage, yeah. and um, he told me how many miles he got to the gallon, I knew what the average at gasoline rate is, obviously what he gets to the gallon is not correct. Um, and I'm going, oh gosh, they're going to slaughter us in the miles. And she passed on the miles, and she's like, all I need is you to go through and, and you know, highlight all the costs that get sold, and as long as it's at least 80% of the number you put down, we're good. Oh. I was like, nice, so no change. And they, I got the letter in the mail, they clients were in Hawaii, so I sent her a, a sexed her, and I'm like, look, zero. No hassle. No, no change. I said, that's good. And I have another one that's getting audited for a year that I didn't, well, actually a year that I did now because they got audited for 15 and they hired one of those firms that advertise on the yes. TV and then they didn't do anything. And so because it hasn't been closed, they picked up 16. Because it hasn't been closed, they picked up 17, which now is where I came in. And I did the return and stuff. And um, I'm like, look, I go, I'm going to train her how to do her bookkeeping because it's something, it's a mess. I go, well, we'll fix it. And I said, but... This lady had four family members murdered in four and a half years. One was their son. Oh. Like, oh. she's had a rough go. 
like let's just get this done and you know whatever the number is whatever we'll offer a little bankruptcy we're gonna end up just you know yeah. I said we'll just let's get but then she's like okay well I've got all these things and we, and we had an audit it was scheduled for yesterday but obviously no one's at work yeah. for the IRS unless you're processing refunds there's no collections and I've got clients going I'm getting intent to levy notices. What do I do? And I'm like, well, nothing. It's an automated system that's sending out the letters, but you can't actually talk to a person at the IRS to handle these problems. Mm -hmm. And you can't set up installment agreements, and you can't make payment arrangements, and you're just going to keep continuing to get these letters until everybody goes back to work. Our audit was, if, if you remember, uh, well, you might not be that old, but back in the early 90s, <laughs> um, they, they, they were so... Uh, the IRS so was looked at as being very adversarial. Yes. And then they went through this thing that says the new and more friendly IRS. They're the kinder, gentler IRS that is actually we on were, their building in D.C. It says it on there. We, kinder, were, we, were, kinder. we were part of that. Adversarial. And they used us as illustrations as to how aggressive. They came in and did something just like a lifestyle audit or something mm -hmm. like that. Three years. And person came in and it was like you said, you should never be there. Uh, you need to have a representative. But we didn't we didn't know this. And uh, you know we couldn't we didn't think that we could afford anybody to come in. But they were coming to our house and it took me probably a couple of weeks to get all of the paperwork in order for that one year and I had it all out. And the truth is you never should talk to these people. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, they come and, here. Uh, they came to my house and then whenever they left, I owed forty thousand dollars. It was twenty thousand, but you just double it pretty mm -hmm. much for all the penalties, penalties yeah. and everything. Mm -hmm. And what we found out afterwards, and, and then they went to the second year, that was seven thousand dollars, and the third year was about right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the problem with all of that, they wanted you to it, to sign on the spot, sign because you, and you sign away all your rights. Yes, and you don't want to do that. You don't. You, you can't go to tax that. court. You can't do yep. anything. Mm -hmm. And you can't you can't uh, negotiate anymore. You just sign everything away, and it just so happened that in their and, and they wanted to send a runner out for me to sign on the last year, because it, it was just it was like a sales thing, you know. And it was at that time they were doing all of this stuff on TV, and then they came out. The people from TV came out and talked to us about it, and uh, but we were one of the last ones to go through that kind of an audit officially anyway. I'm yeah. sure it still happens. They still like I had some some people get audited and they were referred to me by a bankruptcy attorney and they they didn't get audited actually. They had an IRS agent show up at their house because they had money and they had to pay. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's really aggressive. And the lady's like, have you not worked with the IRS very much? And I go, no, no. I said, apparently up here in Phoenix, our agents are too busy to make house calls. Oh, because this was a Tucson agent going to cast a grant. Yeah. And I'm like, I've been doing taxes for 20 years. I have never had an IRS revenue officer show up at somebody's house and go pay up. They came to our house, and that's where they did the audit. And I was so overwhelmed, I could not even move the stuff off the counter for about three months. I was just so out of it. I did have a realtor that got, um, she ended up owing about three quarters of a million dollars over several years. Yeah. And she's 37 now, so back oh. in 2007, 2008, she made a million dollars right before the market crash. She's no. like, I had no business making that kind of money. <laughs> You know, all that stuff. And we, I sent her to a specialist that does offer compromises. The IRS sold for $10,000. I fell out of my chair. Oh, she, my gosh. She owes the state like sixty grand, and they won't negotiate one penny because it, it happened after the elections. They're like, nope, you're paying every dime. IRS took $10,000 on three quarters of a million dollars, and Arizona's like, nope, you're going to pay us $100 a month until you die. It's basically what's going to happen. We paid for a, a person to represent us and offer a compromise, and they kept turning us down. And we hardly made anything at that particular time, but they kept turning us down. And finally, the same guy that did the offer compromise said, I'm going to refer you to a bankruptcy attorney. And it just so happens that they failed to file certain documents, the IRS did, uh -huh. which left it open for the possibility of bankruptcy. And by the time it was all over with, we, we ended up... <laughs> we were able to save our house, mm -hmm. and we were, but we still owed seven thousand out of about fifty. Well, now if you now the IRS, it's pretty. If you if your taxes are more than three years old, you like you file them. Usually the bankruptcies can get them can get them those released too. Yeah. Um, I actually did a, I didn't, I filed an offer and compromise. I did a pro bono for a, um, a former marine that just he can't can't catch a break, mm -hmm. 
And he's like, what's going on with the offer and compromise? I'm like, well, two things. I go, first of all, that was a stall for you to go to the bankruptcy attorney and file bankruptcy because they were going to levy his accounts. They were going to levy his, he does work for um, like property management companies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the IRS sent those people notices and said fork over his cash. They were going to send those letters to them. They did that to too. Yeah, mm -hmm. they can yeah. do that. And so I said, so we're going to file this offer and compromise. which is going to stop them from doing this levy action. I said, but we're going to want you to file bankruptcy. I said, because the three years you owe in back tax for the last three years is a lot less than what you owe everything else. I'm like, then you got to tell the wife to stop getting credit cards and buying crap. Erin, oh. do you have, do you work on a hourly basis? Uh, I kind of, my hourly is 150, but I kind of base my fees on how much time I think it should take me. So if I have tax returns anywhere from 200 to, you know, 1,000 or more, depending on how much time it takes me.